a lot of CMOs are now going to a one-stop shop type model. So basically they, they'll they say, yeah, we can take you all the way from gram quantities right through commercial. We can do your API and your drug substance. But there are still a lot of uh, smaller shops out there that are MedChem shops. You know, they can do the small scale preclinical work. They can make you a few grams of everything. Maybe they can scale up the, the drug that you want or the API that you want to a kilo. But really, you know, they're working in a small shop. That that's that's their business model, and they'll take you up to maybe a phase one. Uh, maybe they'll do some tox work, and then they say we're done. We we're we're not going to change our entire business model to uh, you know to make commercial or or late phase materials. Welcome to CMC Live. This is the show where we discuss CMC regulations and guidances simplified through real-life experiences and risk-based advice. Each episode, we speak with subject matter experts as well as other leading industry authorities with your host, Ed Narkey. So welcome to CMC Live. Today we have an incredibly special guest and we'll be talking about some especially important things. I guess the common theme is you know, make, making a commercial process out of a med chem process. Um, the manufacturing search selection, you know, working at the CMO, transferring and optimizing your process, and then developing a timeline in, in these implementation challenges, some of our experiences. So today we have uh, Dr. Rick Offerman on the podcast. And Rick's a process chemist by training and has worked uh, here with the group at DSI for a number of years. He's joining us from uh, outside of Richmond, Virginia uh, today. He's a senior project management consultant here with us. He's worked at Cam- Cambrex, I think it is, Rick, uh, uh, BI, Eastman Kodak. I know I, I got a lot of stories from Dan, you know, about your interactions down in Tennessee and those things like that. So, Rick, let's get this episode started by going into some of your backgrounds, how you got started, get your thoughts on some of the topics that we discussed, and I'm uh, looking forward to it. Okay, yeah, I'd be glad to, Ed. Yeah, I started out as a, uh, earned a PhD in chemistry and worked for a number of years as a process and manufacturing chemist at uh, Eastman Kodak and Eastman Chemical. Uh, Left there and went on to earn an MBA at Duke University. And since then, I've been doing a number of different jobs in in pharma. Uh, Worked at, as you said, uh, uh, DSM as a project manager. I worked at Beringer Ingelheim in uh, business development and for a number of years at Cambrix and Market Research and Business Intelligence. And I've been a consultant for about five years, uh, doing account management and a lot of other jobs. Uh, feel like I'm kind of a jack of all trades and being able to bridge both the technical world with the business world. So when I'm talking to the business guys, I can say I'm a Duke MBA. And when I'm talking to the, farm, uh, the process chemistry guys, I can say I'm a PhD chemist. So I earn a little bit of cred on both sides on that. Okay. So... So you said something before we started here, um, as we started to talk, making a commercial process out of like a med, med chemistry process. Um, a lot of the folks that we work with, you know, may not have an optimized process, maybe even later in development. So things happen, you know, transfers, you find a new supply chain or improvements in the process. Maybe you can talk to some of that. And I think Brian has some follow up questions on specific things. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, most most uh, drugs, you know, you you basically want to be quick and dirty. You want to kill drugs that are going nowhere. So you don't spend a lot of time up front uh, when you're getting those first few few grams or few kilograms to to optimize a process. You're looking for what we call a med chem process, something that can be generated in a lab or a pilot plant on a few kilos. You don't worry too much about process yields or the types of reagents, solvents, that sort of thing, because you're working on such a small scale. But if you're lucky enough and fortuitous enough, your your drug does well and goes into the clinic, does well in the clinic, and then suddenly uh, you're not you're not dealing with a uh, a process where you need uh, tens of grams, hundreds of grams, or a couple of kilos. Now you're dealing with a process where you might need to make uh, metric tons or more. And the type of chemistry and the process work and safety work that you have to engage in to understand how to make that safely is is quite a bit different. Let me ask you a question. So, so are you, is it one of those things where you're at a point where your existing vendor just can't make that transition for you? Or do you usually find a, a CMO that can do both? Or is it typically one or the other? 
Uh, that's a good question because as a lot of CMOs are now going to a one-stop shop type model. So basically they, they'll say, yeah, we can take you all the way from gram quantities right through commercial. We can do your API and your drug substance. But there are still a lot of uh, smaller shops out there that are MedChem shops. You know, they can do the small scale preclinical work. They can make you a few grams of everything. Maybe they can scale up the, the drug that you want or the API that you want to a kilo. But really, you know, they're working in a small shop. That, that's, that's their business model. And they'll take you up to maybe a phase one. Uh, maybe they'll do some tox work. And then they say, we're done. We, we're, we're not going to change our entire business model to, uh, you know, to make commercial or, or late phase materials. So then you're, as a small uh, bi uh, biotech, you're in uh, the situation where you have to find another vendor. And if you're a small company, maybe you have less than five people, 10 people, 20 people, you probably don't have a lot of experience out there in the world trying to find a vendor who can scale up a process. So you start asking your friends or colleagues in the industry, some, something like that to say, hey, do you know anybody who can do this? And you, you don't know the business models of the major CMOs. Uh, you may not get much attention from a big CMO simply because you only want phase two material or something like that. So you're in the situation of trying to find somebody who can help you go on to that, that next phase of making either phase one material, phase two material, or going on to phase three in commercial. Okay, terrific. So let, let's say you, you've now, based on what you just explained and you've, you've, you've had your selection criteria, you've gone through your search, you've now selected your, your new CMO. You're taking your, as you describe it, your MedChem process, and you're looking to transfer that. How much leeway do you have in, in looking at the process, the robustness, the scalability of the process, and the timing for change? How do you typically assess things like that? Yeah, that's a good question. You, I think the, the important thing is to, when, if you have uh, you know, the initial discussions with a CMO, you ask them, what, what is your process for doing this? So uh, you try to get a, a good sense from them. Have you taken a fair number of phase one processes and converted them into commercial manufacturing? And then you let them talk because if you talk, they'll sit there and nod their heads and say, yeah, we can do that. But let them talk. And then you interview two or three different CMOs. And uh, then you find out it's like, OK, is everybody telling me about the same story? And you will say, tell me, look at my process and tell me where the pitfalls are. Maybe I've got solvents that I would never scale up to commercial scale. Maybe it's a methylene chloride based process, or I've got a bunch of chromatography in there somewhere. Uh, you're never going to go to commercial with, uh, with chromatography in your process. It's going to be very difficult. It's hard to scale. So you really have to, I think, turn it loose with, uh, with your CMOs and let them talk and say, explain to me how you would take my process from this methylene chloride based process that's five steps with uh, six chromatographies to a process where I can make five metric tons or a metric ton, something like that, and let them tell you about it. But you know, you've done your background homework, so you've talked with some smart people who will tell you, you know, this is these are the types of questions you should be asking to the CMO. And whether they're in the in the room with you or or you've done your background work, uh, you know you let you let them talk and then you assess what they're telling you. Okay, so knowing that I'm a drug product person and and coming at it from a different perspective, you'd mentioned solvents a few solvents a few times here. So, I mean, are there solvents that are just not transferable, or what? What are some of the things that go into selecting that solvent because it comes up time and time again. Um, from small scale to large scale? Yeah, a, a lot of it, you know, is it an ex expensive solvent? If you're a MedChem guy, you will basically grab whatever works. And if it's something that's, uh, you know, very expensive, you don't really care because you're only making a few grams or a kilo. Uh, waste disposal isn't, isn't a big factor. Um, but as you're going on to commercial phase two, phase three and commercial manufacturing, then the question could be, a, you know, uh, look, I've got some solvents that are hard to dispose of, or I may have actually environmental limits on the amount of solvent I can use in my, in my facility. So if it's something like methylene chloride, the state that you're, you're in may tell you, you know, you're, you're limited to the amount of methylene chloride that you could actually use. And of course, with something like methylene chloride, how are you going to be able to bring the material in, 
uh, you use it, and then what do you do with it at the end? Do you dispose of it? Do you try to recycle it? Those, those sorts of issues are big ones. Now, when you go to a competent CMO, they'll start screening a lot of solvents. They'll start looking and saying, okay, let's, instead of using methylene chloride, let's uh, do some simple screening experiments, look at the yields that we get, look at the, uh, the impurity profile, all those types of things. Uh, and cost is always a factor, but it's not the major one. Uh, but yeah, things like that will be, and again, you ask the, you, you have, uh, you know, some discussions ahead of time, but you will ask the CMO, uh, how, how, what would you do to eliminate something like the, you know, methylene chloride in my process? Uh, things of that sort. So you want, when you get into manufacturing, you know, you want to go with the minimum number of solvents that you can, uh, you know, the readily available ones, the things you can bring in in a tanker and, uh, dispose of, you know, if it's, if it's by, uh, you know, burning or something like that. Okay, great. But, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the way you typically go about it. But a lot of it is, is too, is, is making sure that you get uh, uh, a solvent that you can use that isn't going to change your product profile. A lot of different impurities or new impurities. And, you know, ideally you'd swap something in that wouldn't change the product profile and wouldn't affect the yield and would just be easier to purchase and dispose of. So now, and, and I want to loop this back to, to Ed, to the, the regulatory component in a minute, but so now you, you've, you've gone through that process. You, you're now moving to the new site with the process and that understanding. How, obviously there's a, a few things that you have to do to kind of orchestrate this whole, this whole thing. And there's also considerations that have to be made for change control. So how do you manage that? Let's say, for example, you are moving to a different solvent. It, it wasn't a good fit. The new vendor's cap comfortable and very capable of handling the solvent that we're going to go forward with. How do you, you do that? You said you talked about the, the, um, the product profile and altering the product profile. There's a big change control component of that. I mean, can you talk a little bit about those steps and those considerations, what you do and don't do? Yeah, I think, again, you know, this is a... a discussion that you have with the CMO and ask them, how will you go about doing this? But certainly, yeah, there's going to have to be maybe some comparability protocols or something that, that will have to be done to show that you're getting, uh, you know, the same impurities. If you're getting different impurities, then there's going to be work that will have to be done to identify, you know, what effect they might have on the drug uh, or what effect they will have in the body, those types of things. So it's, it's a big you know, a regulatory exercise to to demonstrate that the new process is producing a comparable product to the old process. You know, in a long, long time ago on a planet far, far, far away, I used to just know anything, everything about the uh, API side of things before I got into regulatory. But I think I picked up on what Rick was talking about here. You know, it's it's a collaboration and it's an in integrated approach. You know, just to speak to the collaboration part of it, you know, anytime you're transferring something or scaling something up or changing a process, you know, you need to collaborate. There's people involved at the facility, CMOs, right? The DAPI plant, there's the process chemists, the analytical. But, you know, you, you almost have to have a little presence from formulation folks too, because, you know, some of this, some of these changes might affect uh, the act active. And then certainly, as you mentioned, QA and regulatory. When I worked in, um, you know, manufacturing, some of the materials were, were already approved in certain markets for certain drugs. So, you know, you can't just haphazardly change things without effectively um, updating that filing, wherever that might be, U.S., if it's, a, if it's in a new drug, if it's an active that goes into an already approved drug, or if it's just something that you have a few INDs open for, you know, any kind of major changes or even minor changes need to be updated, and they have potential safety consequences. So knowing what you know, Rick, I mean, you know, there's never normally regulatory folks sitting in CMOs, so it's, it's really important to actively manage that if you're a sponsor. Um, you know, knowing that what you know and, and some of the changes that can occur, you know, how how do you feel about that, you know, as far as, you know, being being able to handle not just the transfer or the scale up, but, you know, your your relationship with the agencies to make sure that you're you're fully compliant? Yeah, that that's a good a good question. And like you say, you sometimes when you're dealing with CMOs, you're dealing with, you know, a manufacturing facility. They don't really have a, a ton of regulatory people. So you might have to actually go outside and bring someone in you know, on your behalf. If you don't have that expertise, you're a small biotech company, you have, you know, half a dozen or fewer people, you probably don't have a regular regulatory person. So you might have to go outside and bring someone in to provide, you know, that kind of expertise. And you made a very good point about, you know, the, having the formulation people involved. 
because switching over solvents, you can get into situations, for example, uh, where you get a different polymorph or a dis different uh, crystal form. And so you say, well, you know, the API looks the same. We analyzed it. Everything's good. Uh, but suddenly you realize we've made a different crystal form or maybe several different crystal forms. And when we try to put that into a tablet or something like that, then suddenly we're having problems with dissolution. So yeah, you're, you're right. You got to have to have an integrated approach uh, all the way through the system to understand, you know, the API that you're producing, the impurity profile, the crystal morphology or the, you know, uh, the polymorphs, that sort of thing, and be able to justify those things all the way through the regulatory chain to say, okay, well, we are getting a different polymorph, for example, but we find that the dissolution profile or things of that sort didn't, didn't change if, if you're lucky. So, yeah. Can you talk to us a bit about, you know, selecting or using a partner or CMO that understands the whole process, you know, from preclinical, you're developing a little material for talk study safety information, right? Through commercial manufacturing, as we, we all know, it's quite expensive to, to move facilities um, anytime, um, yet alone, you know, at the end. So, you know, a full, a full service facility, can you talk to us maybe about that? But then, you know, kind of explain some of the limitations of having a large CMO. Yeah. So th there are CMOs that will be able to take you, you know, from the few grams, a preclinical through phase one, uh, all the way through commercial manufacturing. And sometimes there's sort of, uh, you know, they're an agglomeration of companies. Uh, every A lot of the CMOs got into the one-stop shop, but really you're probably de dealing with a different site for the phase one material. So I'm always curious to know how many processes have you taken uh, from your site, you know, in this city or at this facility, uh, how many have you transferred into your major manufacturing site that can do phase two and phase three material all the way to commercial? Uh, give, give me your experience on that because everybody will tell you they can do it. But the question is, have they really done it? And, you know, you go to a, to a one-stop shop because you want to avoid some of those hurdles that you have to jump over as you're transferring you know, from one site to another in the learning curve. And if you're dealing with a with a big CMO, you know, they can, whether the facility is on the same site or not, uh, they can always um, pop in and watch the process, understand it better, talk to the people who are doing the early phase work. Uh, and then you go on and then they, you know, they have their own internal documents. So you have, you should have some seamlessness there in terms of going from the phase one to phase two and then on to commercial. Uh, the problem that you can run into when you get to a big CMO is they might have hundreds of projects going on. And how do you get their attention? You know, some of the larger European CMOs used to talk uh, in, in some detail in their, in their investor calls about having you know, two or 300 projects going on. Well, you're a little biotech company. Maybe you've got 10 people. Uh, you've got a drug. How do you get their attention? and get a, a, a deal with them to, uh, to manufacture all the way through. And, and what are you giving up to do that? Some of the, as I said, some of the companies were, were very good API manufacturers. They bought uh, formulation companies. The formulation companies may not be, you know, someone you would prefer to use, but now you're sort of locked into their system. Or maybe you've got a formulator that you really like, but now you've got to change that formulator to, to fit into the one-stop shop of a CMO. Most of the CMOs have gone that route. They'll, they'll do the early phase stuff, you know, preclinical phase one, try to transfer on to phase two, three and commercial, and then do your commercial manufacturing. And then they've got a partner uh, that will do the, you know, the drug formulation part. And the question is, uh, how seamlessly does all that work? Because that's what you want. You want efficiency in that process. And if you're not getting efficiency from it, then Frankly, why am I going to a one-stop shop? You gave us a few nice examples of questions that you should be asking when you're, you know, after root scouting or, or, or when you're planning to scale up, uh, for example, raw materials, you know, actually, if you can even get them on a larger scale, if you're using solvents, are they acceptable to be using in your process, maybe with your equipment or for safety reasons? Are they affordable? Can you give us a few other examples of questions that you should be asking, you know, in the beginning of this process? Yeah, I, I really look at Going in any place, you look at the experience. And for example, if it is going to be, you know, a, a solvent, uh, are they 
are they handling the solvent? Can they handle a bulk solvent? You know, instead of people dealing with uh, a lot of 55 gallon drums of solvent, they're like, yeah, we got a tank farm out back here and uh, we bring in a tanker of this solvent once a week. Uh, things like that, that make your life a lot easier. Um, anything else? I mean, it's really, you got to, you have to get a sense of how many processes have they taken commercial? Because that's a lot of what you, you know, that's why you're going to a CMO. You're not going there just so they can manufacture something, but you're going to try to get a lot of other useful things done by them, dealing with the agency and that sort of thing. And you don't want to be on that situation where they're learning along with you. I mean, I'm, I'm paying for expertise when I go to a CMO, and that expertise includes, you know, the manufacturing, the engineering, all that sort of stuff, troubleshooting. Uh, I'm not going to be able to be there all the time. So they got to be able to tr man make a process. Uh, when it runs into a problem, they have to troubleshoot it, have, they have the, the chemists and the engineering people on site uh, who can jump, come out in the middle of the night and solve problems, and then deal with the agencies as well. Uh, so any of the – another thing I, that I lo always look at, one of the first things I'll look at is what's the FDA or the, the regulatory record of any particular site. Uh, so you're sitting down with somebody and, and the first thing, one of the first questions I will ask is what was your last inspection and who was it and what was the outcome of that? And did you get any warning letters or 483s, things of those sort? Uh, and all that stuff is readily available, but you know, the regulatory aspect, I had a, a colleague who used to say, that's your driver's license. You know, if you're a cab driver and you lose your driver's license, what can you do? You can't do much. So if you're a, uh, a CMO and you're in trouble with the regulatory agencies, you could literally be shut down. So you have to have people that are very competent, uh, in, you know, in the regulatory aspect of it. And again, that that's what you pay for. You pay for them to smooth over these things. So when I sit down, it's like, okay, you've got chemists. Everybody, uh, you know, has, has a presentation where they show you the, the, the aerial view of the site. They show you the buildings. They show you reactors and they show, show you some guys in coveralls standing in front of the reactors. Well, everybody has that, okay? So what's the expertise that goes along with that to make sure that the guys in the coveralls are, are doing the right kind of things, the guys standing in front of the LCs in the lab are analyzing things properly, quality assurance is doing their part to see that things are released properly, and then you've got a regulatory pathway to get your drug to the marketplace. And so they need to walk you through all those things. And if they give you the, uh, well, we haven't done that, but we think we could, then I'll find somebody who's already done it because I want, I want that experience to, of, of professionals who've done it before and who can do it again. Right, right. And actually, that's interesting, Brian, because I think we were talking with Dave Adams and also Dan Torak in previous podcasts we have about, you know, what goes on really, you know, how the sausage is really made, you know, you facilities and, and you know they usually it's the business development team that walks you around and shows you like the pluses and pros of everything and very often that's not the case you know there's things happen in the middle of the night let's just say or based on the management style and what they've actually done or you know how they operate you know molehills turn into mountains right and there's problems scaling up chemistry so kind of leads me to another question rick um you know so the, ga the aim of the game is to manufacture your drug simple and cheap right and with that lies problems right so if, if the production is not cost effective, it's, it may never reach the market or it's just, it doesn't make sense, right? Especially for companies early on. Um, can you talk to us about some relatively simple cost effective points to consider, um, you know, as you either select or you get into the process of building a scale up, you know, commercial process? Yeah. Um, cost of APIs, it's always kind of interesting because although CMOs get beat up on the cost of APIs, I mean, you're not going to pay 10 times as much to go to one CMO as another. Uh, Realistically, when you look at the cost of an API as a percentage of drug product or the final prescription price, it's usually fairly low. You know, less sometimes it's as low as one less than one percent. So, well, it's a purchasing person's job to beat up on a CMO and get the the best price possible. Overall, it it doesn't really affect the drug price that much. So there are always three things you will look at. You know, you're gonna look at you're gonna look at quality and regulatory history, and, and you'll look at cost. And if they have a poor regulatory history, if you've, you know, if you've been at a site that's, that's ever had a consent decree or a warning letter, you realize how much that diverts their attention. So, uh, 
you, you want to make sure that above all, you get quality and, and regulatory expertise. I'll pay more for that. I really will. Because, uh, you know, I can go to the cheapest, uh, the cheapest CMO, whether it's in the US or India or China someplace or Europe, I can go to the cheap one. But if they have a major regulatory problem, I may never get my product out of that facility. Or if there's a problem, you know, recently we see a lot of things in the news about the nitrosamine problems, uh, nitrosamine contamination in a lot of drugs. And those were really situations where, from what I read, it appears that there were process changes that were being carried out by certain CMOs that were never documented. They just decided it was cheaper to go with another solvent, but they didn't look into, you know, the ramifications. And so now what do you do? Now you're a a big drug company or even a small biotech company, and you've got a drug that's contaminated with a nitrosamine or something like that. Do you have to pull your product off the market? I mean, it, it's a bad situation to be in. So cost-wise, um, that usually would be my, my third consideration. Do you have the capabilities to do what I want? And, and do you have the regulatory expertise that when, uh, you know, and, and which is pretty easy to look at. And, and when you sit down and say, Tell me about your regulatory record. Uh, how many? When was your last inspection? Are you inspected by the following agencies, the FDA, the EMEA, Japanese authorities? Uh, what other routine inspections are carried out? Talk to me about your, your, you know, your 483s. And if you, if you see minor 483s, okay, we all, we've all seen those. But if you see recurring 483s that are, that are worrisome, something like uh, you know, a contamination problem, in a drug product facility or mold or something like that, uh, that that to me sets off the the warning sirens completely. You've you've been beaten up on this 483. So Rick, that's a that's an interesting point. And the more you talk, the more you know thoughts I have. And when you speak about the regulatory you know importance, um, I, there's two ways to look at it. Like you mentioned, the compliance pieces, the inspection issues, you know, those things like that that could trip you up very close to the end and in inspections and and launching. But you were saying, you make is that I think they're minor changes that you know could come back and haunt you. So there's things you know in, when you have an open IND, you know you have very limited information in there, and you're not necessarily required to have justification of your um, GMPs. You know you're not supposed to have your final specifications. But if you do this thing and, and you don't look at the data and where you're generating it, what you'll have at the end. You know, normally at the end, to go back to Brian's point, why it's variable and, and so hard to predict what to write and how long it takes to write an NDA, you know, going back and not having this information, not having justification and conformance information on why you chose certain, you know, not just starting materials, but any any materials, your solvents, your catalysts, anything that goes into the process. You know, you mentioned something about nitrosamines. You know, you make these minor changes. These aren't necessarily updates that you make in your information amendments. But when you start to look at the information that you have, when you're putting your marketing application together and you're trying to bridge that back to the safety information, you know, materials that were used early in the clinical studies, you know, if there's variables there that can cause safety concerns, you know, these are questions that are raised during the review and you don't have the luxury at that point to go back and justify them. So, you know, looking at it from that angle, from the compliance and, you know, 43s and inspection records and history and how many folks actually have commercial products launched and going out the door, very important, but, you know, from, from my side, I can vouch for this, you know, thinking about the information that you're going to need in your NDA, you know, every time you make a change to anything, you know, how does that affect what that information would look like, what that information you'll need at the very end is very important. So, you know, again, back to that integrated approach, most CMOs have fairly, you know, technical, very efficient folks, but again, they're making something to a spec for that phase of development to put into a drum or in bag into a drum and ship it out the door, you know, for payment. They're not necessarily looking at if that's approvable, you know, if, if, it, if it conforms with the safety information, tox information that's filed in the IND. So again, just, just from my perspective, again, you know, these things could be very costly at the end to come and fix. So looking at it from a regulatory eye, you're kind of important. So Brian, I know you have like a million questions. I think I saw you, your brain was thinking or question marks above your head there as we were talking. No, 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 no. It, it's it, listening to you both. It's, it's, I guess the one thing I would say is that, that, Kind of a little bit further back to, to Rick's point about about that CMO that you select. 
one of the things that I will say, and we have seen it uh, certainly in recent years, is that the cheapest choice may not be the cheapest choice in the long run. And we talk about things like just the cost of inspecting, of sending an audit team over, um, just the cost of getting them into a compliance state where you can actually release material. You know, all of those things are considerations. And we do, we have a lot of clients that come in and say, look, we are on a finite budget and we understand that. Some things, however, do cost. And, and I think, Rick, that's, you know, to your point about uh, pay me now, pay me later. It's, it's really making sure that, we're, that for yourselves, whether it's with DSI or, or another, another consulting group, you're really trying to, to chart out the most effective course possible through the whole process. So, Rick, I, I want to ask you one question about the importance of the project timeline. You know, who are the stakeholders that, that feed into this? How often does it stay current? I think those kind of things are really important to make sure all those boxes are checked, as you said. Do you use timelines often or is it, is it an outdated tool or what are your thoughts on it? Oh, no, I think virtually you'll see with every CMO, they'll, there'll be some sort of a timeline and typically in the form of a Gantt chart, something like that, that will say, okay, you know, we have to get this material. What's the critical path to get us to where we want to go? So whether it's, you know, for a, a transfer of a process, for example, you know, how quickly can we get the methods? How quickly can we get batch records? How quickly can we get API and reference standards and things of that sort? And as, as those, uh, as those things tend to lag, I mean, the chemists in the lab can't do anything until they get raw materials to work with. So all those types of things. So somebody's got to have a, a, uh, uh, an overall Gantt chart. Typically, the project manager will have something that's fairly extensive that says, hey, look, if, if we're not getting, you know, the, the reference standards or something like that, the analytical or the analytical methods, for example, if we're not getting the analytical methods, the analytical people can't, uh, you know, put the methods in place and the people in the yeah, well, uh, and this is just early on in, you know, in, in transferring a process. Uh, if, if the analytical people aren't up and ready to go, then when the chemists start running stuff in, in the hoods, uh, how do they analyze it? Well, we don't have methods, so they're kind of, you know, going on a wing and a prayer. So, yeah. And you're basing decisions off of that data, too. Yeah, you're, so, so, yeah. You know. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not. But, yeah, some people will try that. But, yeah, so you've got to have somebody who's a project manager over the top and, and reviewing that you know, project management, the Gantt chart or whatever it is, you know, hopefully on a weekly basis in a, in a combined team, you, you don't want to get into the situation where you simply throw things over the wall and say, well, the CMO will take care of it. Uh, so you got to be on top of it, make sure things aren't slipping, uh, both on the CMO side and, and for example, you know, and, and with the clients I work with, because oftentimes with DSI, you know, we're dealing, doing things on behalf of a client and we've got, you know, information that we have to gather from other CMOs and send it on to the new CMO. So all those things have to be be hitting the mark or suddenly your timelines start to slip. So it's got to be a weekly a weekly type, uh, you know, maybe bi-weekly at the latest, but you got to be on the timeline all the time or things or things will slip. You know, it's funny. I, I I've had discussions with with clients uh, and if a CMO doesn't come with that, that Gantt and that overall project understanding and transparency, you question it you, right off the bat, you question it. But, but there are si situations where we'll have to provide that and it's fine, but I've had discussions with clients and they'll say, well, why do I pay for a Gantt? What does it actually do for me? It's not actually so much about the individual, but it's the team. You're right. I mean, there are predecessors. There are, there are things that have to be linked and they're critical path items. And just like with a regulatory filing, you're tracking those critical path items. And it's, a, it's really, in the long run, it saves you the money because you have that transparency. But, you know, I, I can recall so many conversations. Well, why do I need it? Well, the fact that you're asking for it is a different problem because, you know, you've got a team of people. You may not even know everyone that's involved. You may not know that bench um, analyst that's going to be doing the, the, the method transfer, but they're there. And they're looking for that information and the time at which they start. So in order to make the most effective use of your resources, you want to line them up so when they're sitting down, scheduled to work, they have everything they need to do the work. Right. Yep. Exactly right. You know, the, like I said, the lab chemists can't start doing anything in a round bottom flask in the hood until they get raw materials, till they have a batch record to try to, you know, deduce what's, what's going on. And, and to get the, the process, you know, the familiarization with the process. And I've always been a big proponent 
of, of when you can, you put the, the SMEs, uh, the, the lab chemist, uh, sitting down with other lab chemists talking about the process because chemists always come up with the same ideas. They say, well, what if we did this? And, and you know, they can waste a lot of time. They're PhD chemists and they like to chase ideas. And, and um, you know, so what if we did this? Well, we already tried that and here's what we saw. Oh, okay. Well, so much for that idea, you know, but everybody comes up then you move on. You say, well, did you try this? No, we didn't try that. That's an interesting idea. Maybe that would work. So you, you get the people. And sometimes this isn't in a formal meeting. Sometimes you've got people hanging around in a break room or, or just chatting about the process. You know, tell me, did you guys ever, did you ever look at this as a, you know, as a catalyst for this process? Yeah, we screened a bunch of them. We didn't give you the, we have that information. We didn't provide it. But yeah, we, we screened, you know, 25 catalysts and this is the one that worked the best. Oh, did you try these? Yeah, we did. So, you, you know, so it, it, it makes everything more efficient, but getting the SMEs together, whether it's the chemistry SMEs, the analytical, uh, and getting them to talk to each other, for me, that has solved more problems and literally getting them, uh, chemists working side by side, you bring in, you know, a chemist from a biotech or something, and they work with the, with the, the chemist at a CMO side by side in the lab. Now here's what we did here and here's how this worked. And, Oh, sometimes, you know, we, we tended to see a, you know, an emulsion and uh, well, what'd you do about the emulsion? Well, we threw it away and started over. Okay. That's, you know, that's going to be worrisome because you know that at a point uh, you're going to be out there in the middle of the night with a thousand gallon reactor and there's going to be an emulsion and it's probably not going to be an option to open the bottom valve and, and drain it away. So, you know, why is there an emulsion? For, probably not. So, you know, why, why is there an emulsion forming? And can we understand that a little better? Because you will always run into problems in manufacturing when you scale up. The heat histories are different. The, the times things are in a reactor are different for APIs. And those things often are the, you know, the problems that you run into in the middle of the night that need to be solved. And it's always... And you're setting those initial parameters with the best guess based on your experience. And then you have to dial them in. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the one thing I will say after all of that and discussing the importance of a timeline, one more lovely facet to this whole process is the fact that lately, as you can attest to CMOs are getting busy and they are getting booked well out into the future. And if your process is isn't ready at the time your slot is available, you're not only going to be paying for the delays and the rework, you're going to miss opportunities that are critical to your company's success. So all of the things that, that Rick, that you've covered, I think are really helpful because that is the really the biggest underlying point is that when that milestone for production is missed, all of the ramifications as a result of that. So, so doing that homework up front all of those details, everything that we discussed here really comes back to that, right? It's the end result. Are you on time with your program? Yeah. If, if your raw materials, you know, you're dealing with another vendor who's supplying the raw materials. If the raw materials don't show up and can't be released, uh, you, guess what? You missed your manufacturing slot. And now you go to the end of the line, uh, which might be several months out, things like that. So you, you want to be there. And when the other person misses their slot, you want to have your process ready to go and say, hey, can we slot our process in maybe two months early? Because we're ready to go. We got raw materials. We got expertise. We're ready to go and they're not. We'll take their slot. And you, 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 got, you, know, you, you got to make your own luck in a lot of cases. And you do that by having a process that's, that's well worked out and you're ready to go. Um, and you let the other people make their own bad luck by not being ready. And I think that's the experience part. I mean, there's there's the difference. That's, you know, rubber beats the road right there. It's 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 having been there, done that. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. So thank you. Yeah, because the, the, the lab chemists at a CMO, you know, some of them have a manufacturing experience, but they're always interfacing with the guys who are literally out on the manufacturing floor. And it gets to a point where the guys from the manufacturing floor are coming in and, and watching the process being run and, and they're making, based on their experience, a judgment that says this process is ready to go to, uh, you know, to manufacturing and, and to do it on, you know, a 50 gallon scale or a, a 500 gallon scale. And, you know, they use their expertise and looking at a, a one liter round bottom flask in the lab to say, you know what, this is this is going to be a problem. We we can't contain the heat. We don't have enough cooling or 
this, what is this emulsion that, you know, well, if I leave it sit overnight, it, it typically goes away. Uh, no, that's a process that's not ready. So, you know, that's, that's the level of expertise that you want, people who've done it before and can do it again. And they can recognize where this is a problem. You know, this is going to be a problem in manufacturing. So you need to figure out a way in the lab to get around this so that we don't have, you know, this issue cropping up, you know, in the middle of the night uh, on a holiday weekend. <laughs> Which is typically when it happens. Yeah, really well put. Okay, so I think Miranda had a, got a call. She did have a question for me to ask. I was going to try to do a, a dial-in from her and do a voice impression, but I'll leave it with this um, on this one. So Miranda was asking me, who can you name in less than a minute, you know, maybe some of the influencers on you in your career, you know, how you came to these formulations, people that you worked with. Um, I've often heard from folks that worked with you um, what they actually learned from you. I think Dan Torok mentioned a lot of stuff and what he learned in API process chemistry and manufacturing and transfers. And um, I learned a lot of my stuff from Dan. So in, in essence, I may be your grandson. Can you tell us about, you know, maybe two or three people that really heavily influenced you throughout your career that, you know, you practice their I ideology, you know, you, know you, just, you got the sense of who you are from them, um, just to recognize them. Coming out of graduate school, you know, you don't really know anything about manufacturing. So you come in with a, with a lot of uh, small scale, round bottom flask type experience. But when you go into a manufacturing area, then it's the people who, the experienced process chemists who work around you. And, and you see those people who, um, you know, are able to work with, uh, how do these people work with the manufacturing folks? When I was, you know, a, a young chemist working in the lab, the manufacturing areas were on the other side of a plant that employed 15,000 people. It was a building I drove by every day but didn't know anything about. So it was, it was the kind of people uh, that you would run into who you know, had worked in manufacturing, who had a lot of expertise, who would, uh, could tell you, you know, this is a problem. And you know, I ended up, I, I worked for a couple of years in the lab, then I worked for three years on a manufacturing floor. And then I came back to the lab. And when I came back to the lab, I really viewed things differently in terms of what I needed to do, uh, you know, in the laboratory as opposed to um, from based on what I learned in manufacturing. And a lot of what you can learn, you know, working out on manufacturing is you, you learn it from the operations folks, you know, the guys who have been, who put 20 years in, in a plant uh, running the equipment who can tell you, you know, uh, well, it's, it's nice that you can heat a flask up in the lab in five minutes, but you know, based on what we do out here, it's going to take you about this amount of time to take a thousand gallon vessel that's 80% full to take it from, you know, 25 degrees up to 100 degrees. So you learn a lot of things about that. How long will it take to transfer things? So, and, and when you have that, that those learnings that I got from the people in manufacturing, then, you know, you can do things in, in, in the lab that will help you understand, uh, you know, where are yield losses? And working with Dan on a particular process many, many years ago, uh, we worked side by side in the lab and we ran things like we would as a, as a, as a lab chemist where uh, you can heat things up in five minutes, you can cool them down in five minutes. And when you, when you drain something to do a decant in the water, that only takes you know, you pick up the flask, you dump it over into a beaker of water, and, and you're done. Now, working side by side in the lab, we, we actually discovered that uh, it was the heat history that was killing us on a process. We were losing 10% of the yield, uh, basically because it was taking so long to heat things up, cool things down, transfer things around. And so that was a learning we had where the customer was complaining, well, in the lab, we can get an 80% yield, but you idiots out in manufacturing can only get a 65% yield. And when we went into the lab and ran the process using what we called plant times to do the heat ups, the cool downs and all that, we didn't get an 80% yield in the lab. We got a 65% yield just like we did in manufacturing. So that, that doesn't lead to a contentious situation that, that leads you to a situation where you say to the customer, okay, well, if, if we were able to, you know, add this type of a chiller or do something on heating things up more quickly, that would get the process through. So you start thinking about cycle times and things like that. You know, we know that at this point, you got to heat it up, cool it down and get this thing quenched 
or it's going to be a problem. You're going to be generating impurities. So the people that I learned a lot from were those, those guys who'd been in manufacturing, whether they were wearing coveralls or a lab coat, who could tell you, you know, this is going to be a problem. I, I listened to you. Sorry, Ed, I have to say this. So clearly at the start of this podcast, we talked about all of your, your academic credentials and how impressive they are. But the first thing out of your mouth when you talk about people that influence you were those people. And I got to tell you, that that's what I'm at the risk of sending a compliment. That, that That's what really sets you apart because you're right. People can hear a motor and a pitch will change and they can understand what that means and, and jacket temperatures and all of that. You, you've taken all of your, your accolades academically and then you've, you've married it with listening to the people that are operating the valves and, and, and running the process. And I think that's where when I listen to you with some of our clients in the time that we've worked together, it really comes across in everything you say. So, so to me, when you say you're influenced by those people, it's clear in everything you do. And it is really appreciated. We're lucky to have you. That's amazing, Brian, because I thought the same thing. I didn't hear anybody's name specifically, but I worked in manufacturing and those, they're, they're the thankless people, right? The faceless people that really gave, gave you all the experiences and then you transferring them to other people now. Oftentimes, you know, the guys that out in the manufacturing areas that have the tattoos on the arms and have all that experience, they can tell you, hey, you know, you're a nice young fella, but we just can't heat this vessel up in five minutes. You know, it's going to it's gonna take us an hour and a half. So you, you tell us what we need to do and we'll do it. And then we'll tell you what the equipment will do. And then you need to figure out if that's adequate or not. So they're not people you just walk by. Those are the people who will give you the real practical experience that you can take back to the lab and say, well, what does happen if it if I can only heat this up at you know at this rate, or I can only transfer or quench or something like that? So, those are the things that uh, you know you only get, I think, through um, being willing to listen to a lot of people and understand where they're coming from. I wanted to thank you again, I, Brian, and I both appreciate you know this this conversation. Thanks for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Um, the con- some conclusions I made some mental notes. You know, there's there's several challenges involved with scale up the process. It's not easy. It's different every time, right? It's different to each vendor. So as such, um, you know, evaluations and necessary steps should be carried out. You know, along the process from the beginning to manage these complexities and, and reduce the timelines and prevent any issues. Um, an integrated approach is also important. We talked a little bit about that. So once again, I want to thank you and talk to you soon, everyone. All right. Thank you, Ed. So next week, we're going to be talking to uh, Dave Blasingame on the podcast. Dave is a longtime process chemist that has traveled the world in search of the most efficient API CMOs. Dave will be joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's it for this week for CMC Live. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which include a summary, timestamps, and any links mentioned in this episode, please visit dsinformatics.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the information from this episode and any past episodes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash CMC live. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.